we're talking with people in here so an entity is no different the idea of well you shouldn't talk to them because it's scary and well yeah if you haven't taught yourself to see in the dark if you're not working on your discernment and you're worried that you're going to get tricked and yeah okay you don't know who you're talking to and it's quite worrying um but the flip side of that is where are you going in your dreams who are you welcome to conversation for the soul i'm linda christine and today we have a guest I am so excited to have on here, Hamish Bartholomews. Um, and Hamish is part of, Har well, he's owner of Harmonic Balancing. And he is a thought leader that breaks all the spiritual paradigms. So I am so excited to have you here, Hamish, and talk about all these, all this knowledge that you have. Thank you so much for inviting me, Linda. It's wonderful to be here. Oh, I'm so excited. And unlike most my guests, I have some questions that I typed out ahead of time because I've been binging Hamish's stuff on Instagram and it's pretty incredible. So before we begin with all of that, I always like to ask everybody, what led you down this conscious path? What brought you to your awakening moment? And there may have been many things. What were those things? Yeah, I would... I would almost word that question for myself as what what brought me back to my to my conscious path because I as a child from my memories of being a child I always was conscious I mean I was a child and so I was kind of enamored with everything I suppose I was interested in everything like whether it was the normie 3D world or the energetic world. it was just there was no separation for me it was it was everything was weird and everything was wonderful and you know, terrible, but it was all, it was all interesting. Everything was interesting to me. And so I was that child who asked a lot of questions, who was in everything, always in the way, trying to look, trying to see what was going on, listening to conversations um, that were probably above my pay grade and just wanting to know everything. And I grew up on, um, grew up very rurally um, on a sheep station, like a property with my parents and siblings and grandparents, um, two of my grandparents and my two other grandparents were on another, another sheep property, sheep and cattle property, a couple of hours away. And so I grew up in a very rural lifestyle, um, with neighbors, you know, neighbors, not very close and town once a month and that sort of stuff. No, no power at night. Like the power, the power got turned off at night, the generator and, and yeah. So it was, it was quiet in that regard, I guess. Um, and and growing up like that just you know nature's all around you and, and so you you kind of absorbed in these things but I was I was as much in pulling apart a radio or working out how an engine worked in a car as seeing what makes a tree grow or why does a flower do that or how do animals behave when you when you move around them or, or whatever so it's just everything was interesting and then <clears throat> as I had to go away to boarding school as my older siblings did because there was no high school close for us. Um, so we went away to the big city and went to boarding school and I retained, I retained me, but you know, you've got to, you can only take so much of a beating with a wide open heart out in the big wide world when you're a teenager. Um, and so I, you know, I slipped back into normality. Uh, there'd be a lot of people who would say I was never normal, <laughs> but I, you know, I knew how to play the game to not get com a complete bloody nose. And and I was just doing things my way, but I was but I was very I did get lost in it, like in in the normalcy of having a life, making a life, what even is a life. And and so that probably switched back for me for whatever reason around about 2007, 2008, um, something switched back on. And someone actually the the moment was when someone uh, recommended a Lynn McTaggart book to me, The Power of Now, and and I started reading that. And, I mean, that was straight away I was back into, because I, ha I had been away from that stuff for a while, like Sitchin and Ancient Aliens, and I, I dabbled in all of that kind of thing as a young, as a teenager, I guess, and a young adult, and then moved away from it. And um, 
And so I started getting back into that and into Reiki and into this idea of like spooky stuff, like things working at a distance and, and, oh, there are actually adults that will talk about this. And when I found out that there were adults that would actually talk about spooky stuff again, I, I just kept edging back into the water, back further and further and further. Um, yeah, until here we are. Wow. Now you talk a lot about the Secret Space Program. Were you a part mm. of that? Uh, I think, well, yes. Um, I didn't know anything about that until, like, in those terms until a few years ago. Um, but, like, as a child growing up, I mean, I, I, had, I had all of the above. Like, I had weird space experiences. I had weird time-slipping experiences. I had weird slave gladiator type experiences like I had this I had this bent for army stuff and military stuff just like from a very young age out of nowhere like it made absolutely no sense I had lots of um sleep polar paralysis lots of night terrors for years it drove my brother mad for years because he couldn't he just wanted to sleep needed to be dark to sleep and we had like 32 volt lights when the generator would stop we'd have like lights and stuff but that was about it and I'd have to have the light on to go to sleep because I knew what was waiting for me when the light was turned off. So I'd turn the light off. He was three years older than me. I'd wait for him to fall asleep, like wait till I was sure he was asleep. And then I'd turn the light back on so that I could go to sleep. So, I mean, I I knew, I thought I knew what was in the dark anyway. I knew what what they wanted me to think was waiting for me in the dark, I guess, Um but that wasn't necessarily like when you say secret space program, you get an idea of Star Wars and Star Trek and, and all that sci-fi stuff, which is there. But I mean, it wasn't presenting itself like that to me as a child. As a child, it was just what it was. It was lions and, and big men and animals and dragons and weird stuff and, you know. I guess that's that's part of the stories you read and and the pictures that are in your head get used as screen memories and and whatever. But the those those experiences that that people talk about, um, yeah, I was definitely I definitely had a lot of stuff going on. So I found out later looking back, uh, and I think most people do. I think I think most people who are connected to their heart, like a they have a what we would say they have a spirit, they have a soul, like people, people, full-blown humans. I think most of them have had something to do with what we would call the programs one way or another. I really do because it's just pervasive. It is everywhere, literally Now, everywhere. when this started for you, how old were you? And have you dug into it enough to know how, like what chunk of time you've been gone? Like, was it a 20 and back or was it, intermittent how did that work yeah um it, it wasn't it wasn't intermittent not the first time but it's, I've been gone more than once is what I can tell um so yeah 20 and back was was the first thing but then there's been a lot of other stuff around the edges since then um and I was young um it's like my first memories so I was somewhere between four and five when yeah, I was quite young. How does, how does that work? Uh, it, it, so you're not like a four-year-old, like we look at a four-year-old here. You're like something other mm -hmm. than that? I guess, I guess um, and a lot, this is pure speculation for me, um, but I guess if you're getting taken maybe maybe physically, but then we look at it and we go, but it also works like astrally and energetically. So even if you are taken physically, bodily, um, we know that you can still connect with this stuff like energetically and astrally or in dream. So even if, even if you're getting taken as a four or five year old, um, that doesn't mean you're getting like thrown into a combat situation, like a child soldier in an African or a Southeast Asian sense. Like, I mean, Ender's, Ender's game as a story is a perfect example of that. Like how old are the children that are playing that video game? that are actually piloting real drones that are killing people. Like, uh, are they even 10, some of them in that story? So, so there's a, there's a vast array of um, 
you know, if someone was to take you at the age of five and say, well, I mean, that seems young, but, you know, we've got this special program and and for these people, for this special program, they, they're going to have to be schooled for a couple of years very specifically and there's going to be a high washout rate. So, you know, not all of them are going to stay anyway. I mean, we're chucking children in kindergarten here at the age of three. What are they possibly learning in kindergarten at three? Well, they're learning how to behave, for sure. So there's a lot of there's a lot of that going on. There's a lot of um, behavioural conditioning, I would say, is most of it. Yeah. So how did you come through that experience? Because your demeanor and your energy is very kind and gentle and open. How did you come through that to become the person you are now and not become angry and bitter? Yeah, good question. Um and and how am I coming through it <laughs> would be a good way to put it as well. But, um, I th- well, maybe that's just something to do with, with me in particular. Well, I know there are other people like me out there. Definitely. I've met, I've met them. So there are, um, but I'm, I'm one of those, uh, contrary. I'm very contrary about stuff like that. And I've been, I don't know if I've been programmed that way specifically, but if I was, it was before the programs got hold of me. Let's put it that way. So if someone, and that can be used against you, like if someone pushes you in a certain direction, you're actually just going to push back against it. You're you're not going to do it. And that, that reverse psychology can be used against you. But I think it was, I realized from a very early age, um, and I remember realizing this, like as a as a human in human situations, that when when someone is trying to get you to do something, whether it's kind of hidden or not hidden or whatever, um, they want you to behave in a certain way. That that's where the whole payoff is. Like there's, everything's happening to get you to behave in a certain way. And so, if you don't really like what they're doing, but you're stuck in the situation somehow, you have to be there then the only way for them to not win is to not behave in that way. And, and that, how that, how that runs down the line is all of this trauma training is to get you to close your heart and to not feel, and you can't get out of the trauma training. Like you're in it, you're stuck in it. It's like sleep paralysis, right? You're like a child. You're just frozen to the bed, not knowing not knowing the tricks and techniques for how to get out that we learn as adults. And so you're just jammed there. There's nothing you can do. And you you kind of get to the point of no return. And, and I do remember when this happened to me as a child. You get to the point of no return where you just go, oh, effort, like whatever. Whatever, all right, kill me. Do whatever you want to me. And nothing happens. You're like, ah, oh, this, is, this is interesting. I thought I was running and you were after me because you were trying to kill me but actually you just want me to run and you want me to be scared. So I can run and I can be involved in all the trauma games if that's what I'm getting forced to do and get killed and rebooted and killed and rebooted and through clone bodies and um, however that works energetically, like all of that stuff that should be hugely traumatic. Like as long as I don't close my heart, you don't win. And so that's where I'm at. I'm like, well, I'm I'm not here for you to win. That's not that's not what we're doing here. Like, I don't mind not winning. I don't have to win any damn thing. But you are not winning if your game is to get me to close my heart. So I'll just open it more and see what happens. And that, I mean, it's that has painful consequences. But that's that's kind of how I view everything. I'm like, why? Why am I being pushed to behave in this way? Why am I being forced to do this thing? Why am I being asked to do this thing? What's the payoff for the other person? What What's the end game for them? Okay, so as long as that doesn't happen to me, then they don't get the payoff. I'm good with that. Was it, are they after Lush? Are they after programming Control. you to be dark and something other Control. than what you are? It's a layer cake. That's the interesting thing. And it works just as well in here with the like, you know, governmental, not that they've got much to do with it, but you know, the, 
the governmental wars and, and different things that go on in here from a micro level to a macro level. It's the same thing out there. It's an absolute layer cake. They'll throw 10 or 15 layers into a situation. And if three of them come good, they're happy. And if five of them come good, they're even more happy. And some of the layers even contradict each other to throw you off the scent. And you're like, Oh, what, who, who's this involved with? Where am I? And so it, it can get quite confusing, but but at the end of everything, what it's about is control and how you control people is through fear. And so it's about keeping people in a state where fear is a really easy, either you are afraid or people are in fear of you either way. But when you're operating in fear, then you're on a dog whistle, which means there's someone's blowing the whistle and you can be controlled. So yeah, there's, there's energy harvesting, yeah, there's physical control. Yeah, there's shipments of children and shipments of gold and, and land getting changed hands and all of that stuff. But all of that's irrelevant. That's like that's like so much icing on top of a cake. You know, the cake's this high and the icing delay are like that. Like it's got nothing to really do with that. It's all about distraction and control. And so don't allow yourself to be controlled like even if you're still doing the thing that you're being forced to do, like don't allow your emotions and your spirit to be controlled. Know who you are, hold to that, and and don't get distracted. Like what are you here for? Even if you're here, even if you're trapped and you came here for something else and you're stuck in this weird thing, like you're like, oh, well, I didn't really come here for anything. And All right, so that's good to know. Like that, they're the questions, they're the important questions. What are you here for? Why did you come here? How are you going to get out? What's the plan? Who are you meant to be hooking up with? What's going on here? There, everything else is kind of like incidental, I think. So would you say this is a prison planet? Um, and those of us that that came here that are actually primary characters, not the background people, are we stuck in an endless loop or there's something we a cycle we need to break or something to get off of here how does that work mm, i mean i don't know exactly how it works it's it's always going to be speculation um from what i've pieced together and and many other people have pieced together but I was having this conversation just yesterday actually try to break down on this and and it for me it really doesn't matter whether this place like specifically, whether this place was designed for something else and then hijacked or infected and turned into a prison or whether very sneakily it was actually designed as a prison right from the beginning, but that was like a secret design flaw, design perk that even the builders didn't realise until it was kind of too late and then you end up building your own prison and then you're stuck in it. Like, that that changes all that changes is the um the words escaped me but the the intention all that changes is the intention of the designer because i feel like there was a designer and a few people like this might not resonate with people some people but there are some of us who have this feeling and have been shown like there was a designer of this place and then there were multiple builders and that's what it feels like and and that you know how that how that flows down, who knows? But, I mean, everyone's perspective is slightly different, but the story remains the same, roughly, anyway. And so did the designer design this place as a Chinese finger trap from the get-go and the builders didn't realise and it was kind of to trap the builders and anyone else that came in? Or was it designed with great intentions of a, just a, a place to hang out? And, like, we've got look, we've got all these worlds jammed together. Like we've got the desert world next to the mountain world, next to the ocean world, next to the, it's a pretty amazing place, the way this thing is layered together. And we're probably only looking at a very small part of it, what we can look at. Um, but either way, the way that the light works in here, the holographic nature of this whole setup and how it behaves like prisms, it is a prism. Unless you unless you have the key hardwired into you, so you are the key to get out at any time, and I feel that's probably what the case is with us, and that's why we've been made to forget 
because we don't have the key, we kind of are the key. Um, this place has to be a prison because it is a prism. It is holographic. That's that's the nature of holograms. And so, and when you look at the data and how the numbers work and how the systems work and the programs, like the whole thing is an Ouroboros. It's eating its own tail. It's a it's an infinity loop. It's always bouncing over the same point, but like it's it's designed like a hall of mirrors to get you focusing back in, not to see how to get out. It's really hard to get out. So so the intention, I mean, the intention is important at some point to work on, but if you're just kind of coming to this and trying to nut it out, it really doesn't matter how what it was designed for. It is it is a prison now. It's operating like a prison because it has prison guards and you don't know how to get out. And any any fortress that you don't know how to get out of is a prison under any other name. So do you know consciously how to get out? If the answer is no, then this is a prison for you, basically. I am not coming back. <laughs> I am not <laughs> coming back. I refuse to come back. Yeah. I I, yeah. Have, I I am here or I have been here many, too many fucking times. <laughs> well, well, there's a there's a there's a feeling, um there's a feeling in some groups that either there was a choice point somewhere along the way where it turned from what like where the where the like this virus got in this parasite got in and wasn't actually hard coded in here starting to feel it was hard coded in here but that's just me um sneakily but there's this choice point where where it goes pear-shaped and people like to point at atlantis they're like well there, there's a good story back in time that looks like a choice point where it went pear-shaped perhaps who knows but where where it was like, no, this is this is going to be a good way forward. This is going to be the way to really max it out. And the other group went, ah, oh, no, 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 we're not doing that. That's go that's a terrible idea. That we can see how that ends. No, and the group who wanted to do it that way were hell bent on it. And so the group who, and and so that they they just started doing it. And the other group, some of them stayed to try and mitigate the damage, and others of them went. See ya. We're, we're not hanging around for that and bailed out. Um, and the other way of putting that is, you know, when it was being built and constructed and built out, some of the builders realized that there was a parasite, there was a back door, there was a firewall. This thing was actually getting created like a, a panopticon that someone else was going to be in control of, like a prison that where everything could be viewed, you know, and and they went, we we need to stop building this. We need to just leave. This is not. And some of the builders were so invested in what they were doing. They're like, no, no, this is beautiful. Have you seen what we're doing on floor 57? Like it's glorious. This is like, we can, we can fix this. We can make this work. And and the other group went, there's no way to fix this. This is in the code. This is this is wrong. We need to. And and so there's this idea that a that a, a group kind of knew what was going on in here, but before the before the lock-in started, they bailed out and just went, no, nah, there's no there's no saving this from the inside. We need to get out. See you when the doors open again. And potentially 2012 was this time where the doors opened again. This time's very wonky. And the doors opened and we all got a look at what had been going on inside and went, oh, shit. Like, well, <laughs> we can't. Everyone's so hooked in to this virus, they think they are the virus. We can't switch this off or we would lose them all. Like real death. Like you imagine you died because you think you're this thing that's not real. It's like this wonky deception. And so there's a there's pot potentially a group who jumped back in here, like like smoke jumpers jumping into the behind the flames. There's a group who jumped back in here and threw themselves back down the timeline for this moment here in between 2012 and wherever we end up trying to unravel what had been raveled up and get enough people to detach from the virus, the ego, the system, whatever we want to call it. Um, and that, you know, I have some sympathy with that point of view that resonates with me quite a bit. I know there's lots of people who would, Lots of black pilled people who would like to think, well, that's just another program in here that you're stuck in. And hey, they might be correct. That might be true. But I'm 
you know, I'm interrogating that all the time. I'm I'm always checking over my shoulder to make sure I've not got big blind spots around that sort of stuff. So, so, so far, that seems to be where what it feels like. Who is or who are the puppet masters? And mm -hmm. is there a creator, God, source in all of this? And why don't they knock this shit off and, and fix it? I'll, I'll answer that backwards. There is a creator, God, source in all of this. That's us. And we're in the process of knocking this shit off. <laughs> and if I like you. It. And if you think to yourself, yeah, but gods are all powerful and that it's like, yeah, well, you should be, but you don't think you are. Why not? Well, where are the lightning bolts? Where are the good question? There, There's YouTube videos of people lighting up newspaper with their hands in Asia or in London, Asian guys in London doing it. There's, there's stories of monks steaming, sitting in the Himalayan mountains in the freezing cold, getting wet sheets put in their bodies and steaming them dry and like having competitions to see how many minutes, you know, can you get it under four minutes to steam this bed sheet dry on your back using body heat while you just sit there, not burning any calories. Like, what's your excuse? Where are your lightning bolts? Like, what? Come on. So it's it, it, it's a, that the pointing the finger out, which I've done a bit of um, and still do, like, because I'm, you know, I'm checking these blind spots and making sure. It, it's It's like, but if you were the rescue mission, then how? what perfect way to subvert the rescue mission is to make you think that you're waiting for the rescue mission. You're waiting for the Arcturians to come and save you. You're waiting for the Pleiadians to get the memo. You're waiting for the, the ancient gods to come back and do it. It's like, no, no, that, that's not exactly you. I mean, that is you, but that it's not exactly you, but that you're it. Like you, if there's a source in here and a God point in here and we're having this conversation with open hearts, like that's you. So what are you doing? What am I doing to help get this shit knocked off so we can get out of here? That's that's where we're at. And, and then connecting to a higher version of you, seeing if you can connect to something outside of here that is truly outside of here and not just some sort of little pocket realm, like doing that sort of stuff to to see if you're doing actually all you can be doing. Um, I'm working backwards through your list. So is there a is there a God creator? Well, from the point of view of in here, yes, there is one being that I and other people feel created, like developed this idea of what we're in, this holographic um, copy of many, many other places and and things and frequencies it's a frequency copy and it's and it's glorious like some one if it feels like some one being created it and then many beings carried out putting the symphony together and and making it work um but as far as like how does that transpose outside of here i mean i don't know i don't spend enough time outside of here because if if i was to easily be able to get outside of here regularly um i might not come back so i just don't it, it's just not the mission like i have i have done it to the best of what and i don't talk about it much because how can i prove it to anyone and then people would just think i'm delusional and more delusional so I, I just don't bring it up because it's not it's not relevant to what's going on in here really it's like we just need to get this shit sorted and then we'll worry about what outside feels like, looks like. I mean, this place is copied from something. And so it's a very fair bet that everything that's in here that isn't us has been copied from outside of here and brought in, but distorted. So the colours are tweaked. People talk about remembering purple grass light pinky purple grass people talk about remembering dark blue purple skies and ocean water like it's a different frequencies it's like that no green no like green's not a thing everything's kind of like red and purple and blue and like this people people kind of know 
who've connected with it. Like they know what their home feels like. And it's like, it kind of feels like this, but not quite. The colors are wrong. The feeling's wrong. So this place is a copy. That's why it feels, you know, you can almost feel like home in places here, but it's not quite. So um, if people are getting messages from angels, from galactics, from dead relatives, mm -hmm. are they? Or is that something yes. tricking yes. us? And yes, both. Okay. <laughs> both. Because, because, and like I, I might have said in one of my earlier videos, but I'll lean into this a bit more, um, humans don't know how to see in the dark. Humans have forgotten that they know how to see in the dark which is why I started learning magic, quote unquote, as in occult spiritual science. When, when I started finding out this stuff was real, I went, well, I need, to, I need to know how to see in the dark because that's where it's going on. It's going on in the unseen. And, and you don't know when you're dead, when you have a dream and your father comes to you, and you don't know how to really navigate or operate in a dream. It's like you're used to driving a dump truck and someone's thrown you in a Ferrari and like, you, you know how to drive, but you're, it's all, it's, it's all a bit weird. The responses are all a bit different. And then while you're trying to work out the differences between a Ferrari and a dump truck, here's your dead dad, like overload, right? And he's telling you all this stuff. And it's all like, yeah, that could be the spirit of your father. Absolutely. But that could be something else, just wearing your dad's frequency. And it's like 95% and you're so out of it trying to work out the difference between the, the gearboxes, between the dump truck and the Ferrari and the throttle response, you're never going to spot the 5% at all. So, so it's, it's that discernment of trusting. Do not trust your eyes, like especially in the dream or, in, or on an acid trip or a mushroom trip or an out-of-body experience like your eyes, as in the physical whatever, these data gathering bits, they're, they're the most easily deceived because they work on holographics. And so they're really easily fooled. But you can't, you can't fake frequency very easily. So something, will, and I, I, I use this metaphor with people when I'm working with them, is like you have this dream where you're at home, like your old family home. And it, ha it happens every now and then. And, and it, it just feels a bit weird, you know, like, like certain family members are there, but other ones aren't like you, everybody's there, but your dad's not there. But these like third cousins are there. This is weird. Like that doesn't, it's meant, it feels like Christmas, but you don't, you don't even celebrate Christmas. Like that's funny. It, it, it's a bit off, but it's all right. But then like the, the distance you walk between the front gate and the door is odd like it feels like time's kind of distorting or bending around you and, and you're like it, it's Alice in Wonderland stuff right but everything's and then you're kind of in a room and then you're here and it's like and everyone wants you to eat all this food and now you've got to get your clothes changed and there's funny stuff going on it doesn't it's all just a bit bits and pieces -y, and then it just finishes it's like yeah what if that wasn't your home what if that was a lab what if that was a facility what if that was someone else's house? What if all those beings were techs, scientists in the facility? That would make sense for why none of them really quite match. That would make sense because the, the, the distance between the elevator and the door to the operating room is very different to the distance between your front gate and your front door. So everything kind of needs to bend and distort to make it feel like you're traveling the distance you're traveling in the dream. To make it work like people call these screen memories and you can go if you can remember your dreams i mean getting lucid in your dreams great because once you get lucid in a dream then you can go show me what's actually going on here and it changes straight away and suddenly you can see where you actually are and so this is why you know people say oh lucid dreaming like it's not the dreams are all just happening in here anyway so it's all who cares like it's all in a matrix it's all in a Nah. But, you know, well, then just leave your front door unlocked. Leave your car unlocked. Let let anyone put a sign out the front saying to anyone, come in anytime you like. 
Like, because that's what's going on in the dream. If you're not training yourself a bit, you're getting taken to spaces and and getting these glasses put on you so that you're seeing the augmented reality. You're not seeing what's actually going on at all. So it's like, yeah, when Archangel Michael turns up to you, you could be talking to him. But do you even know his telephone number <laughs> specifically? Like you might know the one the church gave you. You might know the one the Catholic church gave you. You might know the one the other church gave you, right? You might know the one that the Book of Solomon gave you. you you've got all these different numbers for Michael, but are any of them actually Michael's number? Or are they all just numbers to front men who are cloned or screened to look like Michael, but actually they're going to pull you off in a different direction totally? Like that's the sort of stuff that goes on in here continuously so i'm i'm not saying don't talk to angels or demigods or entities or because that would be like saying go to the supermarket but don't talk to the checkout person don't talk to anyone in the aisle like don't just get your stuff and get out again like i mean yeah some sometimes that does feel like a good thing to do but but you know what i mean like we we're talking with people in here so an entity is no different the idea of, well, you shouldn't talk to them because it's scary. And well, yeah, if you haven't taught yourself to see in the dark, if you're not working on your discernment and you're worried that you're going to get tricked and um, yeah, okay, you don't know who you're talking to and it's quite worrying. Um, but the flip side of that is where are you going in your dreams? Who are you talking to in your dreams? Do you even remember what you're doing? Because that's potentially a third of every... 24 hour cycle, you're out talking and doing things and you've got no idea what's going on. So you can't get too worried about um, who or what you're talking to. You just need to know. Like when we do, when we're doing work on removing energies or entities or implants from people's field, you know, someone will have an implant on their shoulder or, or an entity, let's say. But I mean an implant, like an energy. There's an energy sitting there and it's been there for forever and there's some weird contract around it. And it's, this all might not be true, but it's how the energy is presenting. It's the story and we're going to go with the story. And if we were in fear, we wouldn't try and talk to it at all. We just work with the higher self and together we pull it off just like we're pulling, we're pulling off a leech, you know, get the salt, get the cigarette lighter, get the leech off and, and get rid of it. But... What's that going to teach you about energy discernment? Like we've got a captive audience here. You found the energy. You know its color. You know its location. We've even got a bit of backstory to it. Say hello. See if it's willing to talk to you. Don't trust a damn thing it says. Like do not trust it. But why not talk to it? Get its perspective. What's it doing there? It's here to help you. I'm here to protect you. I've been here as your guardian since for the last 25 lifetimes. Like they'll give you these stories. And it'll turn out to be bullshit and you'll remove them anyway. But you start to get this flavor when you actually talk to the, to the, the guys hanging around on the street corners in your body, you know, you start to get this flavor of, oh, that's where that idea was coming from in me. I had all this stuff in me that was presenting as if it was for my own good, for my protection, to help me out. And actually, it was just control. So you, you're not going to be able to piece that together in your own life if you don't ask questions, if you just kind of keep packaging everything up and throwing it out the door. It, it doesn't give you a very good viewpoint of where you are and what's going on. Wow. It, I'm going to go off track a little bit here. Back to the dreams. Yeah. My husband knows he's in dreams. He can control things. He will be in a dream where something bad is happening. And I will hear him going in his sleep because he's yelling out for me to wake him up. Oh, wow. I can't even remember a damn dream. Yeah, that's so how, good. how is somebody so, how do you do that? I mean, practice. Some people can just do it naturally. Yeah, um, he does. Just, na- yeah. I could do it naturally as a child. Um, and then 
And then I lost it and then I kind of retrained myself because there's lots of stuff out there about dreams hidden in different places, dream yoga and that sort of stuff. And and the characters who are coming forward with the information are, you know, sometimes not exactly savoury. <laughs> They've got stuff going on, but you're just looking for data, just looking for data points and then and then moving on. I'm never I'm never doing exactly what someone tells me to do in an information or a ritual or a, I'm I'm never following stuff to the letter anyway, because I'm like, well, there's no way I'm doing that. Like that, that's sticky. Like that, I'm I'm not invoking that being and that. Nope. <laughs> so you know, I I grain of salt everything. I you know, but you can. It is an innate. It's like telepathy and telekinesis, and I. It's an innate human ability, I think. But you can. So you can retrain it again, um, and there are ways of doing it, and it's usually about tricking the human mind and the body um, is a good doorway back in because the body, the physical bodies, but the physical body and the emotional body love repetition. They just love repetition. They love to, like, you know, people start working out and then they get hooked on working out. People start eating five meals a day instead of three, they get hooked on eating five meals instead of three. They like this, the physical and the emotional body, they love habits. They really get their habit forming creatures. The mind, not so much, um, but you know, it'll come along for the ride. And so there are these, there are these habits you can do. One of the one of the funniest and most famous is um when you are in your day-to-day -day walking around, you know, you you're awake, whatever that means, in your awake life. Um funny that awake is when someone's died uh, it's always a good i always get a laugh out of that um but you're in your awake life and something a bit weird happens like just something nah, um you kind of make sure no one's around because you don't want to be a complete weirdo like you might have to go around the corner or in a broom cupboard or something in the bathroom but what you do is you jump up in the air with the intention of floating or flying because you can do that in the dream Usually, if you intend to, your intention is very strong in the astral and the dream space. And so something weird happens, a black cat walks in front of you or you get this weird matrix glitch or, and you go, oh, that was weird. And you jump in the air with the absolutely solid intention that you're going to fly or float or go to the roof or something. And you won't, you'll fall back down to the ground and just keep on with your day. But every time something weird happens, you jump. And sometimes it takes a week or two, and sometimes it takes months, right? But at some stage, you'll be in the dream because weird stuff happens in the dream all the time. You'll be in the dream and something weird will happen and you'll go, oh, yeah, I should jump and intend to fly because that's your habit. And you jump and you, you float. And that never happens to you. Every time you jump, you fall back down. And so in the dream, you jump and you stay up and all of a sudden you're like, oh, shit, I'm dreaming. And it's like this moment where you you wake yourself up out of the dream. So that's one of the ways of doing it. And, and like out of body experience, like getting out of deliberately getting out of your body or astral traveling, if you emotionally spike in any direction, you'll get kicked out. <laughs> that's what goes on. So once you're conscious, like once you're lucid in a situation, if you freak out, if you get really excited and happy because you managed to do it or bang, you'll be straight out, you'll wake up, you'll just get kicked out of it. So that's an annoying part. So you've got to, you've got to like really calmly celebrate inside and go, yes, I managed to do it. And then kind of try and navigate from there. But it's once you're in control of yourself, things will keep playing out like like they do in the dream, like they do here, right? Uh, things will, whatever, because you don't know what space you're in, things will keep rolling. But all of a sudden you're in control and you have a huge amount of control in the dream. The, the adage, the old adage in the magic books was seven times. You're seven times stronger, you're seven times faster, you're seven. I mean, that's, seven's a bit of an esoteric number, but I mean, that's a pretty good rule of thumb. So things will be going wrong in the dream and and it's all about you know trying to harvest you for energy or you know loose you get you the the juicing dreams they're the best ones to get conscious in because suddenly the suddenly the wall of water is coming through the hallway at you and you're like oh yeah well I'll just shut the door 
there's no door there, but you know, suddenly a door appears in front of you, you shut the door. And then a fire starts under the door and the door starts to burn down. You're like, oh well, I guess we'll just get some water in to put out the fire. And then in comes the water and <laughs> excuse me. So you can you can create stuff in the dream. You can create, I mean, and this is your husband's next step potentially is <clears throat> being aware that you're in the dream is one thing, but once you're aware, you have a huge amount of control over your own personal situation. Not exactly what's going on around you, but it's about learning how to leverage that in your own way. Like what can you create? What can you bring in? What what can you do with the situation that's presenting to you? And are yeah. we in another realm? Or is it just something going on within us or is it all of the above? Probably all of the above. I mean, realms, the realms or the locus or the dimensions, or that's a, it's an unsatisfactory way of describing it, but it's probably still one of the best ones we've got. Um, we're in another world. Let's put it that way. We're in another world and quite possibly that world is taking up space in exactly the same world we're in in this moment because it's holographic so you know how many how many angles are on each little holographic shard that we've got like if you like those pictures where you tilt the picture and it goes from one picture to another like if you just tilted all the pixels in the room would this turn into another dimension completely like are they all occupied because it feels like I don't know if this is how it is outside, but it's certainly how this construct is created is like everything is occupying the same space all at once. And the, the Vedic stuff tells you that and that like they can all agree on that, the Gnostic stuff, the South American stuff, the indigenous Australian stuff, like they can break out the locus. Here are the, here are the 14 dimensions. Here are the worlds here. And there's the, there's the demon world and the human world and the, and the God world and the animal, uh, that you can do all of that, like the world of the mind, the world of the heart. But at the end of the day, what they tell you is it is all collapsed down into one space. So we are, uh, we are accessing other worlds, sure. And, you know, when people talk about going to Mars, going to the moon, being on the Kuiper belt, being on, <clears throat> we don't even know what that means. Does that mean they're out there physically? Does that mean it's a it's a planet like a, a, a I mean planet's a weird thing it's actually a star right but but it, does that mean it, it's a ball out there doing something physically does that mean that it's a it's another bit of land outside the ice wall does that what like what does that even mean how how has it been programmed in holographically because we know this is a hologram like no matter what, there's lots of people that don't like simulation theory and they're like, this is God's creation and, and that's a that's a psyop and it. And sure, maybe, maybe this isn't a copy. Maybe this is the original. Like perhaps they're correct about that. But what we do know is that it is holographic. It is like because just the nature of how it operates and the nature of how holograms work is identical. This place is a hologram. So the Vedic stuff still comes up trumps at the end like this is Maya, the palace of illusions. This place is a trick of the light. Like it is because that's all hologram is. It's literally a light trick. It's not there. You can put your hand through it. So I are there other planets out there? Are there other things going on on other planets <clears throat> out there? Or is that part of our illusion as well? Well, well, both. It could easily be both. And I don't know because I, <clears throat> I haven't ever been... I've flown myself to about 11,000 feet to see what it looked like from up there as a pilot. And I've flown in tin cans at whatever they told me I was flying at. I don't know. I could have been in a subway for all I know. Like the, the windows look like we were flying, but who, who knows, right? 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet. But I haven't been up mechanically outside of the atmosphere or, you know, to see is it flat, is it round, how does it look? Are, are the planets, like, you know, planet is a Greek word that means wandering star because it's not fixed. All the stars are fixed except for these planets that, that move on a, on a track, right? <clears throat> so the Greeks weren't suggesting when they said planet, 
they weren't suggesting these things were balls of rock or that like <clears throat> habitats with moon, like that wasn't what they were talking about. They said there are stars that are fixed and there are stars that wander. There are stars that move and the fixed stars run on this pivot and the wandering stars move. So that's what they were talking about. And the idea that, well, Jupiter is just like, well, Mars, let's say Mars. Mars is just like us, apart from some differences that we're told about. And so Mars is a planet, so we're on planet Earth. It's like, are we? Well, last I checked, a planet behaved like a star. Like with my eyes, when I look at a planet, I'm like, well, it's just shining like all those other things are. And they weren't saying a planet was a was a ball of rock or gas or they were saying a planet was a god. Like Jupiter is a deity. It's a it's a bundle of behaviors and energies. So is Mars, so is Venus, so is and and so are the fixed stars. Might we notice that the archangels are fixed stars? Like, you know, Michael is whatever he is in Taurus and Gabriel is like they're the the archangels are all assigned to these big bright stars in the heavens and so what are they what are these lights above our head what are they portals when you look at when you look at them and you say yeah but I look at Jupiter through a telescope or I look at Mars or and it looks like a ball uh, yeah I look at the moon and it looks like a ball too but then it reflect it reflects light like a motherfucker. Like balls don't reflect light. They they just don't. You can't get them to. Even a shiny, the shiniest material in the world, get all the distance, get the brightest light. You cannot get a ball to light up across its circumference like that. A sphere. It's impossible to do. The moon does it, apparently. And then we look at Mars and we go, well, look, Mars and Venus and them as well. It's like, but yeah, but what are you seeing? Like, are you seeing the face of your dead dad, but you're actually looking at something else? We don't know what we're looking at. Our eyes are so easily deceived. What's the frequency of Mars? Have you connected to Mars and had a conversation? What did you get? Oh, well, it's weird. I actually got this thing that's a lot like Ares. It's a lot like Tyr, the Viking war god. It's a lot. Yeah, interesting. All of these other cultures, they weren't pulling out telescopes and building rocket ships and trying to go there. They were connecting with them with their heart like they connect with a tree or a dog or their wife or their child. And this thing was talking back to them and they were writing down what it was saying to work out its personality and what it does in here. Like that's probably more important than... Are there spiders on Mars and is the secret space program colonizing it? It's like, well, maybe, but what does that, how does that affect your life in here? Like, what does that, how are we going to leverage that? Actually learning, learning the personality of that energetic and how it can affect the people around you and yourself and the plants and the weather like that. I mean, for, for in here, that's tangible. You can do something with that. And as far as the secret space program thing goes, and look, I've spoken to a few people about this and I'm like, you wouldn't, when you're told you're on Mars or you're told you're on the moon or you're told you're in a spaceship, what you are is you're in a box. You're in a metal box or a concrete box. You wouldn't have any idea where you are. You have no clue. And you're out and you're fighting spiders or you're out and you're collecting insectoids or you're <clears throat> going down into the mines to work or you're, you're getting told you're flying from here to there. But you could be... You could be 35 feet under the ground in a in a bunker with no windows, you know, with holographic windows. You you have no clue where you are. So Or you could be laying in a chair drugged up like Neo, <clears throat> believing you're in with, these the, with the eye yeah. things on. Yeah. And the and the and the plugs, you wouldn't even need a haptic suit to get all the feedback. Like you could just have the neural things plugged in and and because it's a hologram, right? And and you you would get physical feedback from that and your body because we know we absolutely know that if you can if you can hold that point of view 
vision of like when you do when you do 10 push-ups you know the your hands go away and they come back and the, the carpet comes up towards you and it goes away and you you get your shoulders in the periphery and and you know what it looks like and so if you can close your eyes and visualize that happening and do 10 push-ups in your mind with the full movement no break doing the whole and you see the carpet coming towards you and go if you can do 10 of those your body will respond as if you've done three 30 percent. lots of athletes know this this is their secret weapon like when you haven't got time to train you train up here because if you can do point of view this is why point of view is so big on youtube this is why we've got young children now doing backflips on motorbikes when the first one was only motorbikes been around for 100 years but the first backflip was only done 10 years ago like and skydiving and doing it because everyone now can put a gopro under their chin on their helmet and show the child the person a point of view and if they watch the point of view enough they can trick themselves into believing they've done it because that's how this system works so if you get in and do a hundred chin-ups because like you know, sometimes one chin up's hard, let alone five. If you can get in and do a hundred chin ups in your mind, your body will respond as if you've done 30. You'll get the cortisol release, you'll get the serotonin, you'll get the muscle building, you'll get the growth hormone. Your muscle doesn't get torn down, but somehow it builds up. No movement needed. I'm doing a million sit ups tonight in my brain. Yeah. I'm going to have rock yeah, and, hard abs. <laughs> and when you start doing it, what you realize is it's a lot harder than you think it is to actually do it as if you're doing it because your mind wanders. You start thinking about other things like, oh, I'm not actually here. And you've got to bring yourself back and be right there. And it's like, man, that's boring. It's, t- it's like, yeah, doing 100 pull-ups is totally boring in your head, like properly, doing them properly. But, you know, 30 pull-ups is nothing to sniff at. <laughs> How do you manifest, Hamish? I'm, I'm guessing you kind of have some sort of a system down. Mm, I, w- without thinking about it, <laughs> is the easiest way to put that because I used to do it very easily as a child um, and as a teenager and a young adult. And then, and then I started looking into the back door, the back end programming of all of this stuff and and, and so I, I can see now how it works and why it works. Um, but, I mean, the the trick really to all of that is um, emotion. Like it, it's the point of view. It's doing the pull-ups from the point of view of doing the pull-ups. If you can put yourself as if it's already happened, you'll get something happen. Yeah. And And what I have found as I get more in contact with the higher version of me, the like highest version of me, um, the version of me, however that looks, perhaps that's outside of here, like however we want to word that, what I realise is um, I'm not allowed to go off the reservation very much. Like you just don't get to manifest fun. It's like, when no, we're, we're not doing that. I'm not giving you that. We're not. So it, it, you get to the point where <clears throat> you play around with it, and it's all. But I mean, you're all. It's in the. You're in the sandbox. It's in the thing. What are you actually going to manifest? How are you going to? And if you're in a, if you're in a crappy life, then the idea of manifesting some really good stuff or some good situations, you know, that that does have leverage. That's got some good. Like, yeah, you do want to manifest some some changes in your life, some good stuff. And how you do that is you. You kind of imagine it's already there and you just soak yourself in that like you're soaking in a bathtub. Like you've got to you've got to actually know that it's already happened. Because if you know it's already happened, then it has to have happened. It has to have. And and that's where then you get this disconnect of you do all of that and it happens. It doesn't quite happen in the way that you were thinking it would, but as long as you're not holding any attachment to the money has to come this way or the job opportunity has to come, like you're just open about it, then it'll come in a pretty weird and convoluted way, but something will turn up for you. But I mean, it's always about highest, like most expanded and most beneficial for me and everyone around me. That That's where I go with it because 
if I had this egocentric idea that I wanted to manifest something that wasn't actually going to be for my most expanded benefit or anyone, it wouldn't actually be beneficial to anyone else around me and not to me as well, then no, I don't want that. I think I want that, but that's not something I want. So I, I mean, beneficial is a word I use a lot, like a, a lot. That's my caveat to pretty much everything is, is we're making sure that it's not, you know, it's for the highest good, but it is beneficial. It's going to be beneficial for me and for people around me. And if it's not going to do that, then what the hell do I want it for? Like there are, there are billionaires in here. There are people living on the street in here. Like there's, you can have whatever you want. You can like, there are, there are pitfalls and there, there's internal programming that's going to block it. Like, you know, I, well, I've tried all that. I've tried to manifest and it doesn't work. Yeah. Cause you've got programming that's shutting it off like that. We're riddled with the stuff from parents, from work colleagues, from school, from wherever, like we, we're breathing air that's got weird stuff in it and drinking water that needs filtering. Like, you know, it's just where we are. So it's not just going to work like that if you've got your own internal blockages stopping it and and that there's a lot of that going on. But still, at the end of the day, it's like, is it going to be actually to your benefit or anyone else's benefit? And if not, don't just don't do it. Don't even worry about it. And I don't, I know enough now to know that I have no clue what I need or what I want. Like, like this ego idea of I'm in control and I know is like, I know my mind is not my own. I know that thing's hijacked and you can work with it and work with it. But at the end of the day, like there's no saving that. You can only, you can only go, go through the heart, like the, the mind, the idea of who I am that's just hijacked from the from day one from the get go so i've let go of a lot of control perceived control around that sort of stuff and i just kind of call in what's best in the moment and and stay in that setting and and work with it then i work with what comes you had a really interesting instagram post a couple of days ago where you talked about astrology Mm. can you touch yeah. on that because and uh trigger warning I say for astrologers out there I might not want to hear this but I I, I found <clears> it <throat> fascinating and I'm like wow you're that's right yeah yeah so I mean astrology is really interesting like it's one because every magician needs to know astrology right like every magician needs to be a homeopath and there's a lots of lots of other things in there um but astrology is 101. Like you've got to know what's going on there because it's it's the system, it's the sky clock, and it's inevitable and it just rolls. And and so to get a some sort of a beam on what's going on in here, you do need to look at it and you need to kind of understand it enough to get some idea of what's happening. Um because it is the template in here. It is like lots of the myths are astrotheological, they're up in the sky and 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 even if this is a construct, a matrix, a prison or, or whatever, like that, that's someone wrote on the walls, you know, so pay attention and, and read the writing, work out what's going on. Um, don't make it your God. Don't make it a something that you have to like live by. And, and this is the bit where I got like, because it just gets more detailed. Astrology gets more detailed and more detailed and more detailed. And, and then you've got asteroids and then you've got, and then you're like, okay, so, so are we going like Western or Hellenistic? Are we going Hellenistic or sidereal? Are we, are we going true sky or what, what even is true sky? Like what you trusting your phone's true sky? Like Google's not telling you the truth. You trusting that Google's telling you that that's the true sky. Like, have you got a telescope? Have you made your own? And so at the end of the day, you kind of like none of it, it's relevant, but none of it's actually relevant. Like it, it's kind of like a, it's a, it's a visual representation into a back door of a system and how a system is operating an energetic system of um, it's a mechanism, like a watch, like a mechanical watch is how it's working and it's interlocking. And, it, and it, as far as we can see, we play it out forwards and backwards and the cycles it, it's beautiful. Like it is an infinite 
clock. It will just run, and whatever's powering it, we don't know, probably us, but it'll run and it'll run and it'll run. So that means that, and and we know that it has this these mechanisms in the clock, the jewels in the clock. It's interesting that like proper old Swiss clock mechanisms, you know, the really fancy ones have jewels in them, right? They have piezoelectric quartz or they have these things in them to make them really, the more jewels they have, the finer the movement, the better it works. This sky clock has jewels in it, right? It's got planets. It's got these shiny things and they have an effect on not just the humans, but the animals and the weather. Perhaps the humans are actually having an effect on the weather and the humans are having an effect on the animals and it's just having an effect on the humans. I don't know, right? There's, there's that theory. But it's very convoluted. Like you can, and you can spend a lot of time, you can get very good <clears throat> and you can pull someone's birth chart out and you can pull apart their life. And the less conscious their life has been, the more you can tell what has happened to them, I guess, what, what has happened in their life, um, the more conscious they are not so much because it's an autopilot system. And so if you're quite conscious, this pattern's just going to keep unfolding on you, but you don't have to respond to it in the way that your birth chart says you should respond to it. Like that's not, that, and, and that's not, like good astrologers will tell you that's not the point of astrology. The point of astrology is to learn your birth chart and learn how these energies work in here so that you can work out how to leverage them, however that looks, whether that looks like your evil Dr. X doing things in the world using astrology to help you like we know these governments and people do they pick very certain dates and times to do things or whether that just means that you're you're going to work on not getting triggered by your mother and you know because of her placement in your chart and who you are <clears throat> this particular month or this particular day or this particular alignment you're really going to get triggered by your mother like it's inevitable so don't visit her on that day or really watch yourself on that day and don't fall for it. Like that's not you, that's some autopilot program. You're watching that from the background. Like you can start saying some bullshit flying off the handle and you can you can absolutely disassociate and third person yourself and go, wow, have a look at that. I'm really losing my shit. That means you're not losing your shit. The autopilot program is running because you are back there watching yourself. So you can get back in and just pull the plug on that you do have ultimate control of your bodies, whether we like to believe that or not. So astrology is very important to know and understand and then um, not worry about so much, I don't feel. And and it always seems to me like, and I, I don't know if this was the part you were referring to, but the, the idea of the physics involved in catching a tennis ball when someone yeah. throws it to you. So if I asked you to do the equations, I'm going to throw a ball at you and you're going to have to do the arc, the trajectory, the velocity, the force at which it was thrown, the twist I put on it with my fingers and my wrist. You're going to have to calculate all of that to catch the ball. I mean, there's no way you could catch the ball without calculating. If, if an AI computer run robot was trying to catch that ball, it would have to try and calculate all of that and perhaps could pull it off reasonably well i don't know in the space of time it's going to take for the ball to get to you and that and and we sometimes we do do that when we think about it it's like oh that's coming really quickly oh we, we think about it right but you could just not think about it and throw your hand out and catch the ball and you'll catch it every time who did the calculation someone did the calculation something did it but you, you cognitively, you didn't do it at all. So what is the most opportune time for me to um, raise my prices for my sessions because I'm, I pitched them pretty low to start with and uh, I really need to bump them up a bit on the baseline, but I don't want to piss everyone off about it and I don't want to look like I'm being greedy and I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to feel like I'm being greedy. Like I don't. So there's a good time to go, oh, I'm just going to bump my price up a bit and just bring it in line with a bit of other stuff. There's a good time where you could do that and most people, not all of them, but most people are going to go, oh, yeah, that's like, it was low anyway, like, yeah. And there's another time where you could do that and 
everyone's going to go far out. Like, oh, geez, just because everything else is going up, didn't have to put your price up. Like, wow, it's a bit steep now. Like, well, I don't know, getting a bit greedy over there. Like, and an astrologer could tell you exactly when that is for you, judging on your birth chart, where Jupiter is, where Pluto is, where Venus, like all of this stuff, right? I have three children and I'm working with people. I have no time to calculate the trajectory of the tennis ball. If I want to catch it, I'm just going to throw my hand out and catch it. And so if I wanted to put my price up, I'd just put out there, I should probably put my price up soon. Just just a bit, just the bottom end, just to get it in line with, and then and then it'll be fine. And and just leave it. And absolutely leave it there. And then when the timing is correct, if I'm here, if I'm actually where I live, like spirit, the actual me then when the timing is absolutely perfect, more perfect than I could ever calculate it, I'll just put price up. And I won't know why and I won't know when, but I'll know that when when someone says to me, you should really put your price up soon, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know, I will. When? I have no idea. I'm not doing the astrological calculations. I'm trusting that someone is calculating the flight of the tennis ball and it's not me because I do not have the capacity for that. I, I'm I'm focusing on other things. And so I've just put, I've delegated it. I've gone. I should do that at some stage and just wait for it to come up. So, so the astrology thing of the houses and the this and the that and the, you can try and calculate the most opportune moments and you can, you can learn about yourself and you can learn about your family and you can do all that stuff. But my personal advice is don't get lost in it because that's like, that's computer work. That's data table work. That's logarithmic, that's books of logarithmic tables. And, and you've seen some of that astrology stuff. Like how many actual astrologers would be out there if they weren't using their computer to, to do all the birth chart stuff? Like, yes, someone saying on a thing the other day, like, you're holding your phone up at the sky to tell me where things are. You're trusting that Google's I'm like, yeah, you're trusting the person who wrote the program for you in Astro Gold or whatever you're using, that that's correct. Because how long ago, how long was it since you went back to the grimoire written in 1430 that you've got a copy of and checked it against that and made sure it lined up? Yeah. Like who's doing the, the, logis the logistical checking on this stuff? Because if you're... A modern astrologer now, it's all in a computer. It's all digital and you're using digitized algorithms, which could be getting tweaked like Mandela affected every moment of the day. So I don't want to, I don't want to build my castles in the air on that foundation because it moves constantly. I'm just, I'm just going to trust, trust this. I just trust me. And I, I, I've kept you longer than I should have, but I have one more question and then maybe you'll come back another time because I, I just love the information that you're sharing. You were talking the other day on, um, it was a, it was a conversation on your YouTube channel you were having with a gal and I've been experiencing this as well. And I think there's probably a lot of people out there that have been experiencing this to where I get hit with these, you call them ripples, but they're like waves of just unconditional love and joy and bliss. It's almost like I'm like, what drug was slipped into my drink? I, this is incredible. Yeah. And it kind of comes and it goes. And you talked about it leading towards what a lot of people have been talking about for many years now is this event um, mm -hmm. or the flash, or I believe you um, referred to it as a big purple wave. Um, can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit about what, what's going on with all of that and where you feel this is headed and when that might happen? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So so this is just my my personal experience from what I've been shown, which may be correct or not, and and data that I've gathered from other people. And so it's very much an in-here perspective. Um, but 
this feels like a this feels like to do with the way out to me. Uh, that might sound fanciful to some people, but that's okay. That's I hope that's you're just, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so it feels it feels to me like a because it's a heart recalibration. It's a heart opening. It's a it's a it's a bliss wave, but not. Not a physical bliss wave. Not a, not a. I mean, a, a drug. Drugs not a bad way of putting it because it's like it's a total body, but it's past the body as well. It's like it's at all levels. It's this. It's this. I mean, bliss is the only word. It's just everything's perfect all of a sudden, and and not in a not in a rose colored glasses. Now everything in here is perfect. Just like no, no. Just you know that you're perfect in a way like just everything everything is okay you can manage whatever is going on is that's the kind of feeling that you get and and a few of us have been feeling like you've said just like like pre waves like ripples like little little waves <clears throat> and a lot of people have been talking about an event or a solar flash or a wave or whatever they've been seeing it they've been shown it and i was i was shown this I've been shown it a few times. Um, I can't even think when the first time was, but it was was kind of back in the 90s was when I probably had my first inkling of it and of that colour, that purple colour. It's a hard colour to forget. Um, but more more recently it was, you know, in the mid-2000s. Um, and I just had, I had no frame of reference for the the dream or the vision or whatever it was, but it was it was like a large purple wave of, I mean, light, but it wasn't light. It was just colour. It was a frequency is what it was. It was presented like a frequency. And it rolled like, um, see, I grew up in the outback, so for me it was it was presented like a dust storm. It rolled like a dust storm for me. So, so not, like a, not like a tidal wave coming up or a big wave crashing over. It's just this kind of this rolling, billowing edge of a cushion coming at you. And then all of a sudden you're in it and then you're really in it. And and there's and that's what it was like. And um and it presented itself through me like a the best way to describe it would be like a 15 minute orgasm. Like it was just bang. Like it were it was that it was that flashpoint, but just dragged out. <laughs> and it just it poleaxed everyone. Everyone went to their knees. Everyone fell over. No one, no one was not affected by it. Um, no one was unaffected. But then some people got up sooner than others. Some of us were a little bit more calibrated to the energies because the energies didn't stop. It was not like a fifteen-minute orgasm and then done. It was just it just kept going, and it kind of hit a peak, like an intensity, and it didn't build anymore. But it didn't stop. It just it was just there all the time, and so it's like, how do you, how do you navigate? How do you even get up and walk around while that's going on? Like it's it's quite, uh, it was quite challenging in the in the dream, like in the space that I was in, some sort of a, a simulation of because I was feeling it. It was a full on, yeah, and mm -hmm. and then those of us who got up were helping others to get up. And and some people just were never going to get up. You could tell that was they were they were done. Um, but it it just felt from there like I don't know if everything got better. Is a good like it's a bit Pollyanna, a bit of a Pollyanna way to put it. But but it's like everything couldn't not get better because everyone's heart was blown wide open. So everyone who had a heart, like as in an energetic heart, everyone who could connect to their heart. It was just blown wide open, and you and you were put. You were in your heart. You were not in your head. You were not behind your eyes. That's the other thing I remember is like we, we this there's this default setting where we can go down into our heart or we can get into our whole body to kind of look at the world around us or, or whatever. But our default is kind of behind the eyes because of how the eyes operate. Once again, it looks like the eyes are a real Trojan horse in here for us. They're they're tricky. They're such tricky things. Closing your eyes a lot is a good thing to do. Um, but no one was behind their eyes. They were all behind their heart. 
They were all viewing from their heart. And the head was kind of there. The brain, it was all still there. It was all like the the all-seeing eye floating above the pyramid, right? It was up there floating, disconnected, doing its thing. But we were on the capstone of the pyramid. This is where we were. We were we were in our hearts. And so how how do things not change when every single sold and spirited human, I mean, let, let's put it in the black pool sense, inside this prison is operating from within their heart and they can't get talked out of it? How long is the prison going to stand after that? Like, probably not that long. And and the purple was interesting because it was like that colour thing we talk about, some colours in here, like green is just a bit wonky in here. Green's not a green's not a colour somehow. It's just a right angle of red. It's just it's just the red frequency flipped 90 degrees. It green's this funny thing. And and everything that is green now was like some funny shade of red or purple or blue. And it didn't ever come back. So it was almost like once that wave went over and everyone got into their hearts like not only not only were they then operating from their spirit from their soul like who they actually are without any kind of add-ons or viruses or anything um, programming but we were actually seeing things how they were meant to be and so colors all kind of changed and things and and i didn't really get the feeling of of time as in when when this would occur except like in in this lifetime is an absolute and i've always known like from a very small child i've always known something was going to happen in this lifetime and and like i was never going to die as in die it just didn't feel like that something else was going on and i just knew it i had no and i still don't really have a very good way of um articulating that but it's just a feeling that i've always had and um yeah whether whether this place gets fixed and we stay here or whether we migrate ourselves to a new platform that isn't so infected rather than fixing this one i mean maybe both maybe some people stay and recalibrate this one if it's possible some people go to another one and maybe some of us just go home because we know that these these places aren't our actual home, so so I'm I don't know how it unfolds from there, um, but that but that's the feeling. The feeling is well, well people kind of get what they want, they get what they need, however that looks. Whether that's a we save Gaia and we fix planet Earth and we do, like whether it's that or whether it's we we go to some new place and we start fresh with no is that well there's the, let's just go home like do we have any skin left in this game at all like what what even is this and and so people it just feels like people get what they need to to fully heal and and reintegrate back into themselves again because that's still still in all what we're talking about is a lot of people are still a bit lost in themselves and disjointed in themselves and and that's that's what we're doing that's what you're doing that's what i'm doing at the end of the day we we can have wide ranging conversations about who knows what but where the rubber meets the road is we are trying to help people to get back to who they truly are and what they truly are and we're doing that for ourselves at the same time mm. and it really doesn't matter how that looks at the end of the day as long as that's what we're doing I so appreciate you sharing all these thought provoking things with us today. I just really love it when, when that muscle gets worked for me. And I, I think a lot of other people will as well. And I would love to have you back at some point later this year, if you would be open to that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It was a, it was a fantastic chat. We went, awesome. we kind of went everywhere, which was fun. It is. And I still have half a lip list left. So we will say that for another time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hamish. And don't go away. And we will say goodbye to everybody out there. Bye bye. See you.